So if we're all ready, um, let's kick this off. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Lovely to see you tonight at our second Yarn Night. Uh, my name is Lou, I'm Sound First Storytelling Coordinator, and I'm very excited to be hosting tonight's Writing to be Heard. Um, firstly, I I'd like to start by acknowledging the land of the traditional, the traditional owners of the land in which we stand, in my case, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, land was never ceded, and, and we respect their autonomy and sovereignty over the land. Um, just a little bit for those of you who do not know a lot about Soundfair. Um, Soundfair is a not-for-profit organization before it was uh, better here in Victoria. So we've been around for about 85 years. Um, and basically what Soundfair stands for is achieving hearing equality. And the way we do this is by basing all of our efforts through stories of lived experience, which I'm very excited is exactly what we're doing tonight. Um, so we have the belief that people are more than ears at that hearing health is not reducible to just hearing aids, that it's not just a physiological problem, but that the negative impacts that living with a hearing condition can have in a disabling society extend from, far from just like physical issues. Um, they involve psychological, emotional, social um, impacts that also need to be addressed. So we take a patient-centered approach to hearing health and really are advocating for a holistic view of um, the person. And um, so we do on one hand clinical services, yes, but in another, we also do a lot of advocacy work and social um, initiatives such as this one, where we're trying to get the stories of the people from the deaf and hard of hearing communities um, to use that as evidence and base all of our efforts with that evidence base. Um, Yarn Night, this is our second instance. So we're very, very excited. It's still very new. Um, this is a monthly event. It happens on the first Thursday of every month. So if you enjoy tonight, please come along. You're more than welcome to join us um, in the months thereafter. We have a theme for each night. Um, our first theme was diagnosis, um, the time that I first knew. And tonight we have the theme of writing to be heard. Um, tonight we have four beautiful storytellers that we're very excited um, to be hearing their stories. We have Fiona Murphy, we have Darren Roberts, Ella Paredes, and um, Kate Disher Quill joining us. So the way the night's going to work, um, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers um, before they go up. Each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes, share their story with us. And then at the end of the event, I'm going to open up the floor so that um, we all have a conversation and we don't want it to be like a very formal question and answer panel format. Please feel free to, to talk to the speakers. The main idea is for us to have an exchange of ideas and um, a resonance and an engagement. So we'll have about 20 minutes for that at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker for tonight, um, Ala Paredes. So Ala is a Sydney-based writer visual artist, teacher, and mother of two, who lives with sensorineural hearing loss. Many of her career choices have defied her hearing loss, and she now advocates for it through her writing and on social media. Through writing about hearing loss, she discovered that she had a supportive community of both, of both non-hearing and hearing people. And as her hearing loss is invisible and irreversible, her most powerful tool for living with it is her voice. Ala, welcome. All right. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Ala Paredes, I'm 38 years old, based in Sydney. So as mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a freelance writer and also an English language teacher and a visual artist. I have moderate to severe sensory, neuro, sensory neural hearing loss in both ears and I need a hearing aid. Um, I should be wearing it more often, but I, I wear it mostly in crowded places. So I grew up in the Philippines and hearing loss actually runs in my family on my mother's side, but I did not know this because it was never spoken of. It was never spoken of even when three of my uncles wore hearing aids. And as far as I knew, there was only one deaf person in my family, my uncle Jiggs, my mom's eldest brother. He was born profoundly deaf due to complications with hydrocephaly as a baby. And the way I see it, because Uncle Jiggs was profoundly deaf, 
I feel like my grandparents had such a hard time dealing with having a deaf son that they didn't really bother with the other kids who had hearing loss. So for those uncles of mine, those three uncles with hearing loss, growing up with a deaf brother, I mean, partial loss must have seemed like a trifle in the family. It was not made out to be a big deal. And um, so there are actually two kinds of deafness in my family. So we have the genetic sensory neural hearing loss, which three of my uncles have. And we have my uncle Jiggs, who is completely deaf due to hydrocephaly as a baby. Right? So three, three uncles with hearing aid should have seemed like a warning sign, right? But I was never screened for hearing loss. Nobody looked out for the signs. And so I was absolutely floored when I was diagnosed with hearing loss at age 19, and even more shocked to hear that it was genetic, that it ran in the family. I was like, what, you know? Um, but at the same time, it made perfect sense. Um, all my friends knew, uh, knew me to be like a space cadet, you know, always floating around in space. Um, a friend once commented that I was a conversation starter, not an ender. I could begin conversations, but I would trail off. You know, my concentration was very poor. I always knew that something was not right. Um, I couldn't concentrate in class. Whenever the teacher would call me to answer, I'd be like, what? You know, I never knew what was going on, but I would score highly in my tests, you know, because when I studied on my own, I did fine. I found it really, really difficult to sit down and listen to someone talking for a long time. And I still do, even at my age. So anyway, back to my family. So clearly all these years, it had been the deaf elephant in the room that was never talked about, never acknowledged. And even after I was diagnosed with it, it still wasn't discussed. It was like, okay, I have, he I have hearing loss. Everyone else had a lot, of, a lot of other people in my family have it too, so now what? It's not like everyone banded together to support me or anything that didn't happen. And so I ignored the problem. You know, I thought I just live with it like my mother, like, like my uncles. And I didn't really consider it a significant problem then. And it didn't really fit in with my, with my personal narrative at that time, you know, how I viewed myself to be. I was only 19 years old. Um, this was 20 years ago, mind you. And back then in the Philippines, I was a model and I was a TV presenter. So, you know, a very glamorous career and being hard of hearing did not fit in with that. <laughs> so I got away with it for a long time, just kind of guessing my way through social situations. So um, people with hearing loss are exceptional at pretending that they know what's going on. We know all the social cues, you know, when to laugh, when to nod, when we're having conversations with people, even though we don't really know what's happening 100%. And I even excelled at the sort of careers where you would never suspect I had hearing loss. So I mentioned, I was a television host. I was interviewing people on camera with my hearing loss. How did I manage to do that? <laughs> I don't know. When I moved to Australia, um, I worked in hospitality, taking orders, you know? I sang in a band. I was really good at faking it. Until my late 20s, when my hearing began to deteriorate even more. And um, I really began to feel the way it limited my life. And um, it really hurt me whenever people would dismiss me in a conversation. You know, that thing when you ask people to repeat themselves and they say, nah, never mind. You know, it's like they get tired of talking to you. It would hurt when they would laugh at me when I didn't hear the right thing. Um, like I knew I wasn't stupid, but I worried that people would think that I was stupid. And um, also people thought it was acceptable to make fun of it. And because of that, I felt pressure to appear normal, even though I knew I wasn't normal. And I began to feel really insecure about my future job prospects. I knew I couldn't work in hospitality for much longer. And I lost belief in myself. And even then, I didn't really think the hearing loss was, was responsible for it. Somehow I, just, I, somehow I just thought I was defective somehow. Something was wrong with me. And I was very depressed towards my late 20s. I eventually caved in and got hearing aids. 
and they did help. But I was still very insecure knowing that I had hearing loss. I was terrified that I might forget to take the hearing aids to work with me. I would have panic attacks thinking about going to work with, without the hearing aids. I was a teacher already by then. I was an English language teacher. But what changed things was I was at work one day in the staff room with all the other teachers. And I asked my boss to please repeat something that he just said because I didn't catch it. And he started going, huh, what? You know, he was making fun of me. He was pretending to be hard of hearing. He was going, eh, eh, what? And um, usually I let it slide. But that time, I think I began to, to get a bit upset and people could see it. And my coworker noticed this and she stood up. She cut in she, and she went straight to my boss and she said, that wasn't very nice. And everyone in the room fell silent. She had just told the boss off. And my boss went red and he walked out of the room. And I was just like, wow, somebody stood up for me. I didn't think that my disability mattered enough for anyone to stand up for me. It was a really big moment, you know? And my boss apologized to me very sincerely after. I think it was a big realization for him. I think that a lot of people, um, a lot of people, I think it's funny to make fun of people who can't hear properly. And, um, and I think a lot, of a lot of people feel that way because the disability has never really been humanized. It's always the subject of jokes. It's associated with, with growing old and it's not taken seriously. So I decided to write about it, to give it a human voice. So I eventually wrote an article for SBS and eventually ABC. Um, I can, show you, I can show you the article maybe at the end of my talk, yeah, just very quickly. And when I published those articles about you know, living with hearing loss, um, I discovered that it was more common than I thought it was. You know, I was not alone. There were like so many young people out there who had hearing loss. I found a community of sufferers and it's really affirming to hear that they have the same fears and anxieties that I do. The fear of your hearing aid breaking at the crucial moment. <laughs> you know, the fear of um, not being able to get work. And I also learned that even mild hearing loss has um, really significant effects. Like it's linked to memory loss, low self-esteem and anxiety, um, higher rates and, um, oh, sorry, higher rates of unemployment and a higher risk of dementia in old age. And at the heart of it, hearing loss is a communication problem. It's not really more than a hearing problem, it's a communication problem. And a great thinker named Marshall McLuhan, he once said, okay, this is, a re this is a really important quote to me. He said, the quality of your communication is the quality of your life. So I'll say that again, the quality of your communication is equal to the quality of your life. And these are words that I take to heart to remind myself why I mustn't let my hearing loss prevent me from living. And I decided that it was up to me to reach out to people and teach them how to communicate with me because they didn't know how. They don't know how to communicate with people who have hearing loss. And it was up to me to teach them. And to do this, I would have to openly identify as a person with hearing loss and really make it visible by talking about it and writing about it. And this took an enormous leap of courage. It still feels very vulnerable to let people know about it. But it's either I do it, I come out with it, or I fade away and I stop, you know, and I lose the courage to reach out and connect with people. And so far, it's really paid off. I tell all my coworkers and all my English language students as well about my hearing loss. And I'm surprised at how accepting and considerate people can be when I, when I make myself vulnerable and tell them about it. It's also really helped my family realize that we are in fact a hearing loss family. We're a hearing loss family, which explains a lot of the way we behave and miscommunicate. In fact, my mom eventually went in for a hearing test and discovered that her hearing was even worse than mine. And just today, today before I went online, um, she told me that my grandfather and his sisters all had hearing loss as well. <laughs> Go figure. So that makes four uncles, my mom and me, 
<laughs> and my grandfather, hopefully not my children, but if they do have it, I want to prepare them. I want them to be better prepared. I want them to have more knowledge and information, more support than I did, and to not let it stop them from being whatever they want to be. So I hope they carry it with more confidence from the very beginning than I did. And that's the end of my story. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing, Ella. It's, it's really a pleasure to hear you. Um, some of the things that you said really struck me about, for example, how hard of hear, how being hard of hearing is not necessarily considered glamorous and how that had a very big contrast with um, your career at that moment. Um, and you, like, it's almost like being two people at the same time, I imagine. And also um, the importance of support about how, like, because you didn't have the information um, available, and no one was speaking about it and everybody just kind of like lived with it. And it's like this, this big elephant in the room, how that really made an impact in terms of how you went through life and how um, until you found that courage and that voice, um, it, things shifted and how your writing kind of played a big role in that. Um, that, that was fascinating. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Um, if anybody's having any tech problems, uh, my colleague Lisa Westhaven is here as well as a co-host. So please let us know if anything comes up um, via the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna, well, no, not in the meantime, but I'm gonna welcome our next um, speaker, Fiona Murphy. Um, like many deaf children, Fiona struggled to learn how to read and write. When she finally became literate, she felt like she had overcome her deafness. It took her years to realize that that was autism. Happily, as she has made her writing career, she's discovered that no matter what she does, her writing voice is always deaf. Today, her work has been published in Kill Your Darlings, Overland, Griffith Review, and The Big Issue, among other publications. In 2019, she was awarded with the Overland Fair Australia Essay Prize and the Monash Undergraduate Creative Writing Prize. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the Ritual Prize and highly recommended by the Wheeler Center Next Chapter program. Her memoir, The Shape of Sound, is now out through text publishing. Fiona, I give the floor to you. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really, really delighted to be a part of this. And growing up, I would never have imagined the level of excitement that I would feel talking about deafness because for so long it was this an immense secret that I had and so much of what Alice said I completely relate to. I spent uh, the vast majority of my life um, passing as a hearing person and really downplaying any difficulties I had um, with hearing and communication. So I'll kind of go back to the beginning. Um, I was six years old when um, it my teacher at school noticed that often my copy books were completely blank. I would sit in class and much like Arlo with being a space cadet, I was very quiet and seemingly studious, but uh, nothing, nothing at all was sinking in. Um, but because I was so well behaved, um, I could slide through the cracks quite well until it got to the point where I was about to go into year two and it was pretty apparent that I was completely illiterate. I couldn't even spell my own name, um, which is kind of prompted the teacher to speak to my mum to say, I think she has a learning disorder. Perhaps she should go get tested. So at that stage, they didn't know why I couldn't read and write. Um, because I coped fairly well, I could speak fluently and I seemed to be well adjusted socially. So it could have been any possibilities. Um, so I went to an early childhood testing centre, did a whole bunch of tests of stacking blocks and looking at different colours and numbers and speaking tests. And at the end of the day, I did a hearing test and I can vividly remember, which I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, have had that experience of stepping into that little booth, putting on those really hard, hard headphones that really stick into your skull and being given the small pressing button. And as being so diligent and studious, I took this test very seriously. 
And I can remember my hands being really sweaty as I pressed on the button and I listened to all the sounds. And I thought I did pretty well. I was like, yep, that was the easiest test of all the tests. This is wonderful. And then that afternoon I was diagnosed as being profoundly deaf in my left ear. Um, at that stage, uh, there was no treatment for it. There's no hearing aids powerful enough to um, produce any level of functional hearing in that ear. And they weren't doing cochlear ear implants for unilateral hearing loss. That's something that happens widely now. So I think if, um, if the circumstances occurred today, more than likely my parents would have been strongly encouraged to have me implanted. But at that stage, the audiologist looked at my mom and said, she seems like a good girl, she'll be fine. And I was sent on my way. And that was that, um, which obviously it wasn't that at all. Um, going back to school, my mom at that point recognized that I was still really struggling with the basics. Um, I didn't have any support in the classroom whatsoever. So she kind of stepped up to become my teacher at home. Uh, she worked full time. I was the youngest of four kids. So this was an immense amount of responsibility that she took on to teach me how to read and write because I just wasn't getting that support in a public school. Um, funnily enough, the school had a, a deaf unit in the school, which was a small classroom with children with um, disabilities, but it was mostly focused on deafness and they had Auslan instruction. But um, at that stage, like is still very much the case, Auslan was considered the last resort. So I wasn't given the opportunity to go to that class. And at that time, I was really proud. I thought, I'm better than them. I'm, I can speak. I'm obviously so much better than any of anyone who uses sign language. And that's a real shame that I have now that I have this real perception of um, different types of deafness and who can call themselves deaf and who's allowed to learn sign language. So it wasn't until my late 20s that I even considered the idea of learning sign language. I had this real um, perception, which was kind of fed on by the audiologists that only certain people were allowed to learn sign language. And because I was only half deaf, um, I was okay and I would be fine. So I had this real idea of that as soon as I learned to read and write, I had overcome my deafness and that was something I was tremendously proud of. Um, I really thought that I had beaten my deafness and I didn't really see it as a part of my identity or who I was. And I didn't recognize until much, much later how much deafness has formed my identity from my personality to how I structure my day to how I engage and interact with people on so many levels. I just assumed that was who I was. I didn't really um, kind of realize or reckon with of how deaf I am in um, personality and attitude. And I mean that in the kindest and happiest way now. I feel really proud to be deaf and to speak to other deaf people because just like Alice said, there are so many, so many similarities and um, overlaps to how we approach the world, how we are so flexible and intelligent with finding out information that isn't readily available to us whether that's asking key questions to kind of pull out information that we miss or being really flexible in how we set ourselves up in rooms that are really loud and noisy and how we use the environment to help us and cues. And I became an absolute bookworm. For a long time, I didn't realize that that was my way of acquiring information in a way that felt comfortable to me and wasn't exhausting. It's only recently that I realized how exhausted I am all the time. Again, I thought everyone had headaches at the end of the day. I assumed it was normal to come home from work and collapse on the couch and not be able to watch TV or talk to people and just I needed to be alone for so many hours of the day. And that's really 
a reflection of how much work I do when I go out into the world and I talk to other people. I need to rest and recover. But the difference now of knowing this is I can plan for my week and my days in a way that's meaningful. So I'm not crashing and burning out time and time again. I was in this real cycle, particularly in my 20s, where I was so determined to socialize and work hard and play hard and just be in the world that every few months I would become absolutely bedridden with infections and illness and just literally burn out. And now knowing that my deafness does impact my life, I account for it in a way that feels important and empowering rather than something that is um, disruptive. It is something that I am getting better at um, talking about it and advocating for myself. Um, like Ella said, I constantly worry and stress about work opportunities and financial security. And the idea that my occupation at the moment as a physiotherapist does involve so much listening and communication. So I'm still very much grappling with how to um, find a career path that suits my body, but also suits the aspirations that I have um, with work. And I don't think that's going to be sort of a um, I don't think I'm going to reach a, a point where it's a clear cut pathway at all. I think it's going to constantly change, particularly as technology changes as well um, and the impacts of that. But I think these conversations are so useful to have because we've all picked up a lot of skills along the way um, that I feel like I've learned so much from deaf people about what it means to be deaf more so than from any medical person or audiologist. Real tricks and tips of how to survive in the world has come from other people who've lived that experience. And I just hope that um, I keep learning and picking up more information along the way because it's absolutely changed my life making friends with deaf people. Um, it makes me feel less alone. And I think we all have a, a similar uh, sense of humor and attitude towards it. Um, so I'm really, really excited to be here and um, I'm looking forward to the asking you all many questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Fiona, for sharing your story. And um, I loved what you said about how the shift happened when you started considering um, the being part, hard of hearing as part of your identity and, and, and something intrinsical to you and who you are versus seeing it as a burden or an obstacle or something that you didn't want to, to have associated. And I think one of the things um, that are very important is finding that sense of pride and just like embodying ourselves for who we are and understanding that we're all very vastly different and the, the spectrum is huge and that that does not make us better or worse than anybody else. It just has us with different perspectives and that's enriching for, for us and our relationships. Um, so that, that, that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, our next speaker is Darren Roberts. Darren was born deaf and bearable. He wore hearing aids until he was 29 and then became fully deaf from when he was 30. He's a single father of three beautiful children who established the and established the Auslan company in 2004. So he could take his children to school, pick them up, attend all their sporting activities and just be a home dad. Today, along with Learn Auslan Online, he continues to provide Auslan to workplaces, Auslan training to workplaces, schools, childcare centers, and to families with deaf children who have NDIS funding. Tonight, he will be reading from the children's book he wrote and self-published. It is a story of a deaf dad who uses Auslan to communicate with his children. Welcome, Darren. Uh, hi, thank you for having me here. I want to make them normal because I had everything I had to do anything, but I thought I would have tried to go over my children. Yeah. Um, we, we had different things that happened in the house. So, <coughs> so I went to publish a book, had a beautiful um, illustrated. 
try to not try to have a problem having a a live payment on a live illustrated book for me. I measure and. I mean, they interested uh, over the book how to publish it themselves. So I just wait now for uh, tomorrow, tomorrow week. They will let me know if will I publish for me. That will be tonight. I have the book by Danny. I will talk because I can't have time and talk at the same time. Holding the book, don't have four hands. <clears throat> For Samantha and Hayden, who were the inspiration for this book as young children, and who as adults continue to inspire me, you are both a wonderful blessing in my life. My daddy is deaf. He cannot hear anything at all. And he cannot talk. But he is still special to Hayden and me because he is our dad. My daddy has taught us to use sign language. It is called Osheim, and my brother Hayden and I use it to talk to Dad. It is like a voice, only we use our hands to sign words. My daddy has lots of different things to help him look after us. He has a flashing light to tell him different things like when he's burning the food and when Hayden is crying. When someone is at the front door or the telephone is ringing. My daddy is just like hearing people. He loves singing in the shower. He loves cooking and reading and playing games with us. He loves riding horses and he drives a car to work. My daddy is real clever too because he can lip read people saying naughty words. I love my daddy. He is deaf but I wouldn't change him for the whole world. And that was the end of the story. Just um, end. Um, that was the story. Um, um, really like, about my life growing up, same as Ella, like, growing up. I was born, but only before they found out my parents found out me like them because my brother was them. They looked straight away. They test me like that at the same time. Found them. Grew up, went to school, went to a private high school. They, they teach it, but was too. That passed up year 10 because I wanted to become a jockey that worked with horses. At 17, I probably can't become deaf, like hearing aid means if like horse, but then brain damage. If um, people on the horses uh, me can't come here, mean horse. So I my first degree 
have three different degrees. So I think I decided to work with horse and business management of my first degree, then travel overseas to work with horses. Then later in the 20s, um, disability degree, to work with people with disability and good housing for the HHS. And then my third way was um, Bachelor of Education for Lake Auckland. When I finished that, I set up the offline company. Why? Because I have like two, two children, man, man, and paid that time back to my partner, my children, how because working disability, different hours, like shift work. It map when I have a children job off at school. So I set up a business, work myself, home, my hours much less. So for 17 years, I worked um, the bit of business, be a teacher plan sometime now. So I have 15 teachers working for me. They I teach offline through Australia. Most work up community workplace, uh, child care centres, um, offline uh, load in primary schools, and um, most now offline with families have deaf children with India as family. Main uh, teachers through Zoom or mm, we teach families with deaf children to communicate in offline. Oh, children had one or but one both offline with so that's uh, the business today. Lots of people through coronavirus couldn't come to class if we couldn't set up class. So I decided online offline could work last year. Now I know still today like people well, so I'm like, busy with that area. So that's my life at the moment. I accept I'm deaf because you know, growing up, I was 29. Well, because two minutes, just like, uh, two minutes up. Crazy. Uh, uh, so through time, I've learned how to, how to manage like that. And at the same time, because I grew up really like a human person with a human aid, I started to learn offline at the same time I was starting to become an offline teacher, offline a uh, low teacher. Only like really like the time for 24 years. So my offline would be like, bah, 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 that I employ teacher to be teacher offline. They, um, yeah, so really as a deaf person, I love because of the peace and quiet, but the stress mm, and means I can, like, yeah, don't have mm, open like, noise, really. And most people with my mom, I say me, and they, mm, and they talk to me and I liberate, okay. So I find most people that do corner power with my were happy to. Mm, one day for like dev, I have no issues at all. Like the dev have over like uh, everything, but really, I think depends on attitude, how you approach people. I think that's really like important. Like the dev can be, but I think me like I just approach people one realize they will accept and will learn how to communicate with you this way. Um, yeah. oh, that's my story. No, I hope that's okay. Thank you so much, Darren. It was fantastic to hear you and to as well like see the art of, of the book that you have written and self-published. That was amazing. It was a really good experience to um, both Thank see you. and hear it at the same time. Um, and I really um, want to congratulate you for 
just like what you mentioned about how it started with something small and now it's kind of grown into something really big that um, is changing the lives of so many people. So that's really, really inspiring, inspiring to hear. Thank you so much, Darren. Yeah, really good. We like how, I think uh, before coronavirus, we were like teaching offline to 5,000 people a week. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> And um, one of the things that we um, have talked about often at Sound Fair is how diversity of like having choice is very important and how um, having Auslan as an, as an option is fantastic because it's, it's basically um, being multilingual. And um, I went to a show during Midsummer Festival by um, a man called Sam and he was saying how when he was growing up he got um the ill advice of a medical professional well, his parents got the ill advice of a medical professional who was like you have a choice you can either teach your son Auslan and limit his um like he won't be able to communicate with other human beings or he can learn English and um, be able to to live in society as normal and it's like what why is that an either or? Why not both? Why cannot we be part of both worlds and have more skills um, under our belt? And yeah, it's just, um, I'm really happy that you're doing this. Um, our last speaker for tonight is Kate Disherquill. Kate is a Melbourne-based artist working across photography, film, publication, and multimedia. Her debut solo exhibition, Right Here, Right Now, featured as part of Sydney's Head on Photo Festival and toured to photo access in Canberra and No Vacancy in Melbourne in 2016. The project was developed into the publication Earshot, which portrays a myriad of experiences of deafness and hearing loss. Earshot has received high recognition within the arts, health, and ideology industries for intersecting art and storytelling with, with health and education. Kate, I give the floor to you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, so my story is not unique, uh, much like we've heard tonight. It, there's a lot of um, similar experiences that I went through, but I suppose the irony is that we all felt like we were the only ones that wore hearing aids or that were deaf. Um, so my, I guess, journey into hearing loss began when I was three years old. Um, my mum noticed that I wasn't really speaking and that I had started to uh, look at her lips when, I, when she spoke and was sort of mimicking her mouth. And um, they took me to an audiologist and turned out that I had um, a very severe ear infection and they thought that maybe I just needed to get grommets and then I'd be, it would all be fine. And so I got grommets and turned out that I did have a hearing loss that um, was permanent. And at the time it was mild to moderate. And I was, I guess I'd, I don't really have any memory of it, but um, every year after that, I would have to get my hearing tested. My parents were told that I would eventually need hearing aids. Um, those days, they didn't think it was necessary to give a child that had a mild to moderate hearing loss um, hearing aids, whereas now, now they certainly do. Um, and I suppose it, it was quite a negative experience for my parents. Um, you know, my mum was told that I wouldn't be a party girl. And obviously, she was quite devastated by this idea that her child wouldn't some, for some reason, because she had a hearing loss, wouldn't be social. Um, but for me, the, I guess the painful experience really began when I was 10 and I was fitted with hearing aids. Um, obviously, up until that point, I thought I was managing just fine, uh, even though I did have to get my hearing tested every year, which I did not enjoy. It wasn't something that I had ever kind of considered this idea that I was deaf and that um, I would have to kind of face this, this world of wearing hearing aids. It was something that um, I associated with elderly people, you know, I sat, would sit there in the audiology centre and see images of old people or babies. Uh, I'd be sitting there with old people sitting there next to me 
And it's sort of this, I had this idea that, that there wasn't anyone young out there with hearing loss. And so, of course, I felt incredibly ashamed and isolated. And at that time, uh, I also had to see a special needs teacher. And so I, I was actually quite competent at learning. Uh, you know, I was very quiet and my mum was also a, a primary school teacher and then became an ESL teacher. So she, uh, without me knowing, obviously helped me quite a lot. And so when I had to see a special needs teacher and she walked into the room, I think I'd, in my head, I'd probably been given the hearing aids that week and they were, you know, big and chunky at the time. And, uh, you know, I was quite horrified by having to wear them. Um, and she walked in, you know, and was like, oh, I'm here to see Kate. And I'd have to get up and walk out of the room. And, you know, I was an intelligent child, but in that moment, I was just like, I must be an absolute idiot. I'm having to walk out and see this special needs teacher. There's obviously something wrong with me. And we'd get, you know, we'd go to this other room in the school and we'd sit down and she made me do these little exercises. And I clearly remember one of them. Was I had a piece of paper and I had to do, the, draw the things that she said. And so it was put a triangle in the left square of the page. Now I'll draw a line from the top of that triangle to the right top side of the page. And I just sat there thinking, what's wrong with me? Why, why do I have to do this? Is this, this doesn't make any sense. It, must, it doesn't make any sense, so therefore I must be stupid. And from that moment, I sort of, sorry if there's noise out there. I feel like my partner and stepchild are making a bit of noise. <laughs> um, but basically from that moment, I, I got this idea that I was never going to be very smart, that I wouldn't be good at reading and writing, that I would never be good at English, that I wouldn't be good at language. And while I never said anything, I spent the next, basically the next 15 years feeling that way. Um, all through high school, I was always trying to get the, the smallest smaller hearing aids. Um, I always thought every time I would get a new pair that this time I'll start wearing them and, and feel comfortable wearing them. And, you know, it started off with any ones and then they got even smaller any ones. And I thought, surely now I'll feel comfortable wearing them. You can't even see them. And no matter what, it, it did not change anything to how I felt. I still would not wear them. I'd wear them in the classroom and then take them out the minute I left the classroom. It was something that I just thought, okay, well, I'll use it to help me learn. But then socially, there was absolutely no way I would want people to see them. Uh, I ended up studying visual communications. I suppose I thought that my hearing loss was the reason why I was drawn to the visual medium. Um, and then I later became a photographer. And I never, up until basically I was 26, I, I felt incredibly ashamed by my hearing aids. I wouldn't tell people about them, much like we've heard tonight. I thought that people would think I was less competent. I didn't think it was glamorous. I thought people would find me unattractive if they saw them on me. And then all this changed in a matter of minutes when I was 26 and I was reading Frankie magazine and I just stumbled upon an article by a young woman who was the same age as me and this, this short story was about her experience with deafness, being deaf and also a photographer. And I basically just broke out in tears and reading her story was the first time I had read about the exact things that I had felt. And it basically just shocked me so much because I couldn't believe that I had 
got to that age and I'd never read anything that it's not only my story, but for the first time it actually seemed interesting. In that magazine, that story had value and I thought, wow, this is so fascinating. Why have I never thought that my story was fascinating and worthy and that it could be in a magazine? And it, that feeling basically shifted my whole perspective, but it also made me think, imagine what I could do with a project that shared so many stories like this. Imagine if I had been given a book when I was 10 years old, being given hearing aids, and someone had just handed me a book filled with these beautiful stories of people with all different kinds of experiences of deafness, and that it looked good, that it was beautiful, that these stories had value, and it showed hearing aids, and it showed cochlear implants and Auslan, how different my journey might have been and how different the journey of so many other people out there could be. And so that was basically the beginning of a five-year journey to make that book, which I did end up making into earshot. Um, but it was just a photography project in the beginning. And I basically started just meeting people, putting things out there to try and um, get people to participate, their stories to share. And I didn't know anyone else who was deaf before that. Um, and it opened up this whole world because it meant that I could search for people, meet people all over Australia that had hearing loss and deafness and in the process just learnt so much about it. But it also forced me to wear my hearing aids and feel proud of my hearing aids. I remember starting the project and thinking and going off to meet, you know, um, one of the subjects. And I, I would always just have the hearing aids in my bag and I would only bring them out in situations where I felt that, you know, I, need, I needed them. And in that moment, I was like, well, how could I be doing this project as a deaf person needing hearing aids and not wear my hearing aids? And so that was basically the, the kind of catalyst for me wearing hearing aids. And now, I mean, the idea of not wearing them now is just absurd. Um, and the idea of feeling ashamed of them or worrying what people would think to, is now such a distant kind of feeling. Um, but I don't know, yeah, what would have happened if I didn't read that magazine and pick up that, find that article. Um, I believe my time is probably up and I think there's a lot of um, great conversations that we can now have and uh, yeah, um, let's open up, open up the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Kate. Such a good story. And I, I think some of the things that I take um, from your story that we have seen as a theme across the, the four stories that we heard today is um, number one, the very narrow picture that we have of what um, being hard of hearing is, um, be it from like not having the information about it and not knowing exactly what's happening. Um, to what you were saying, Kate, about you think hard of hearing and you thought old people, you didn't think, you, you, you couldn't identify with the images that you were being portrayed. Um, and in that sense, all the work that the four of you have done um, is, is fascinating in the sense that it's, it's a huge step towards representation um, in that it, it, it has st stories and showcases stories that people will relate to and that um, like what you experienced, Kate, you, you stumble across this article and that's what changed the way you were living your, your hearing loss. And um, how powerful is it that each of the works that you, that you each have done, we don't know how many people that will reach. So it's almost like a multiplying effect um, stories. 
so so I find that that that's fascinating for for tonight um, specifically, and and I guess also the other thing is the unforeseen welcome experiences like meeting all these people and um, having this children's book to for your kids and for for other people to to relate to you know um, it's probably things that maybe were not necessarily related to what you were intending to do but that surprise you along the way and that have kind of a, a cascade of positive effects um, so firstly thank you so so much um, to the four of you for gifting us your time and energy and for all the work and passion that it, you put into your daily projects. Um, and yes, absolutely, um, open up the floor for conversations. Um, if you, if anyone in the audience and also our storytellers, this is also open to you because I'm sure you also have comments and questions. If anybody has um, a comment or a question, you have two options. You can either write it in the chat and I'll be um, picking up the questions from there or if you'd actually like to um, speak and, and appear in video, you can also raise your hand in Zoom. Um, there's a little hand option. Um, so raise your hand and I will um, give you the floor as well. Um, so some comments that we have, Maxine is saying um, to Kate that she loves your work. And that it was great to explore um, your work at Sounds for a Hear Me Report lunch, which happened in early March. And um, also, Darren, with your with your children's story, that it, it's so powerful because it can also help children understand um, Auslan and, and deafness and, and what that entails. So that's like we're talking to different cohorts here. Um, Fiona, I can see your hand up. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Um, I was really struck with how many of us, uh, we started feeling very alone uh, being deaf, um, but we've kind of come into this identity in a really proud way. I was wondering, Kate, how did you find so many deaf people for your incredible book? Because the stories like you said, you went all over Australia, but there's so many diverse and incredible experiences that I just felt my mind expanding when I was reading it. It was so joyful to read. Oh, thanks, Fiona. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was quite a journey. So the very first thing I did uh, was put up a Facebook post and it was sort of me coming out about my deafness because a lot of people that I knew had no idea you know people that I grew up with and went to school with or you know some people at university knew but people that I'd worked with and stuff throughout my you know early 20s had no idea um, so it was this kind of get it out there and see what comes back to start with um, and you know and some people from that just that post were like oh I've got a friend you know, who's, who wears hearing aids or my cousin is deaf. Um, so there were a few people that came from that very first kind of call out. And interestingly, those were the people mostly that also had never spoken to anyone about their deafness. Uh, so it was quite a, you know, this really nice kind of exchange for people to just feel like they, they were for the first time speaking with someone who understood and then I also started reaching out to different organisations. Um, and so I, I, you know, I wanted, I started, I had to learn about deafness in the process. You know, I didn't know anything about Auslan, the deaf community. Um, but, you know, through, I guess, starting, I started learning Auslan. And then I, you know, I, I knew that I wanted a diverse range. And so it was, I, I wanted profoundly deaf people that signed. I wanted people that had cochlear implants at diff in different ages. So, yeah, and then from there I even asked people, oh, do you know someone with this story? Like I, I guess I suppose I, I did seek a range and so I would just meet people and then ask and then meet different organisations. And But, yeah, I definitely built a whole community by making, by making the project. Thank you, Kate. Um, I believe Darren had his hand up. 
Darren, do you have something to, to say? Yep. Um, I'm seeing, I've got another question from Tanil. It says, um, some of you have spoken about negative attitudes, such as not being encouraged or supported to use Auslan and difficult situations and environment that you have encountered. Um, give me one second. I wanted to ask if you could change one thing about the Australian community to improve the lives of people who are deaf or hard of hearing, what would it be? I might quickly jump in. I think the idea that hearing loss or hearing health issues, because there's so many different types of hearing health issues from tinnitus to auditory processing issues, not so much necessarily just hearing loss, is that it, it, it's on a spectrum. So the whole idea of which was brought up earlier, mild hearing loss doesn't mean mild difficulties with communication or um, children who only require a small if no assistance in school or somebody with moderate hearing loss is moderate difficulties and moderate assistance or profound is something that is um, requiring a lot of assistance. I think the thing that would help the most is to individualise um, the, the person's experience because I know I definitely within myself downplayed asking for help and assistance because I thought, oh, I can get by. I've got half, I've got one functioning ear. Obviously I'm not allowed to ask for help or um, I can just, you know, make the most of it. So I think it kind of, if we can talk about hearing loss as being an individual experience, not only does it kind of open up the possibilities in educational situations and workplaces, but it also takes away the idea that only certain people have hearing loss, older people. Um, certainly when I disclose my hearing loss, I'm rarely believed and it's often forgotten. So it takes a tremendous amount of courage for me to be vulnerable. Um, but because I've picked up so many skills to pass and cope, um, most people um, don't um, follow up in the kind of the weeks to months after that disclosure and the, the burden of work falls back on me time and time again. And that courage to kind of build it up and be like, actually, I. I do need help, I am struggling here. Um, it makes it a difficult conversation. So I think the idea that um, hearing loss is complex and multifaceted and more than just ears um, would be useful. Ella, do you have something to add? Yeah, um, just to add to that. So um, Camille was asking how the community may be able to help. Um, well, let's talk about um, our, immediate, our most immediate relationships first. My husband has perfect hearing. And, um, you know, of course he gets frustrated with me. He gets frustrated talking to me when I keep asking him to repeat himself. And I accept that. We make fun of each other, you know. But I think he was under the impression that if I got hearing aids, the problem would be solved when that is actually not the case. The hearing aids aren't perfect. They're uncomfortable. It, they give a very unnatural sound. It's not the same as, it's not, a, it's not an organic sound. Like no matter how high quality your hearing aid is, even if you get the most expensive one, it still feels weird. It's weird. And I told him, I was like, um, this improves my hearing, but it doesn't mean that the problem is solved. I still need you to adjust to me. And I, and I told him, it's so much easier for you to adjust to me. You just have to speak a little bit more slowly and clearly. And whereas if I had to adjust to you, it would take a lot more effort. And I think that's what people should understand. Like if I were the only person in say a staff room or in an office that were hard of hearing, it would be easier for everyone to just slow down a bit and talk a bit more clearly than it would be for me to get hearing aids and try to keep up with everyone. It would be like the amount of effort that it takes is disproportional. You know, so like what Fiona was saying, um, mild hearing loss this doesn't mean mild difficulty. Like I, that really hits the nail on the head. Like that's the perfect way of explaining it. So, absolutely. Um, Darren, 
Um, I want to go back to the original question about um, what can be done about um, deafness and like help deaf people in um, our community. I think the biggest thing that we have when we're working with families with deaf children is that most of the doctors um, want children who are born deaf to have a cochlear implant or at least a hearing aid. And that's the first thing that families who have never experienced deafness in their whole lives um, get deafness is bad, sign language is bad, therefore you should have a cochlear implant and make your child um, try and speak. Now, I was born deaf, but I was born with the ability to speak. Many deaf children are not born with the ability to speak and need speech therapy. I really believe that in this world, there should be the opportunity of bilingualism, right? So they um, learn to be a hearing child and learn to be a deaf child at the sign language. I think it's really important that parents understand what is available out there because it's early intervention, like in Victoria, they tell um, Aurora and next sense, I think it's also in Sydney as well. So what I'm trying to say is that families with no experience should be said, okay, if a child has a cochlea, they will not hear 100%. They may hear 50% or 60% or 40%. It depends on the deafness. But at the same time, you should learn sign language as well because at the very early age from when the child is born, um, all the way up to about six is when the language ability is um, learnt, that you're able to develop your language skill. So whether it's spoken language or offline or German or um, French or whatever. In autistic is when language acquisition is best in children. That's why many children um, who learn languages from a very young age can speak multiple languages. So I really believe they should be given both options. Now, the biggest problem we have when we're teaching families is that the parents themselves don't understand that immersion in Auslan is necessary. You can have your speech therapy and you can talk to your child, but when you are talking, you should be signing at the same time. Even though Auslan and English are both grammatically different, in young children, it's okay. I think, like pre-primary school, like you talk and sign, like, Where's their dog? Now, where's the cat? Did you hear like that? Where's daddy? Where's the where mummy? <laughs> where's daddy? <laughs> right? So just simple things like that. And then the child starts to learn. So I think having access to both. Because later in life, maybe they go to our school, they can have access to interpreters. Uh, maybe university, they have access to interpreters, but offline. But where, if they had cochlear, and they didn't hear like well and they went to university maybe they missed what the lecturer is saying yeah so they're pros and cons i really believe a bilingual approach speech and offline is best absolutely thank you so much darren um kate i believe you had your hand up as well oh, i i feel like my answer kind of had a little bit of what you all said um there was a bit of self-advocacy so it's like we're having to advocate for ourselves if there was a way that uh, I think having stories representation encourages people to advocate and the more that um, we see this the more that we feel comfortable if if we see other people advocating we feel okay to say sorry I've got hearing aids can you repeat that um, sign language Auslan I agree is something that while I, my parents definitely wouldn't have thought that it would be something I needed when I was a child. It certainly would have helped. And it also would have, um, as Ala said, it's about showing that other people will, I guess, fit into our needs as opposed to us having to adapt. You know, I grew up with my mum always talking to me from other places in the house, yelling from upstairs, yelling from other rooms, and I would always go to her. If she had used little bits of Auslan, I think it would have helped her remember that her child was deaf and that you don't do things like that. You go, your child needs to see you when you speak. So little thing, like 
my partner, for example, he's a, a sound engineer and works with musicians on stage when with their in-ear monitors and is always having to sort of sign things to them, just not Auslan, but just uh, visual cues. And I remember the first time that he won, you know, one night was just like, oh, having a shower. And what that meant, but I was just shocked. And it, to me, I was like, that is the simplest thing that anyone could use that I, it just makes life easier. And so if, if Auslan was something that was, you know, you don't have to become fluent even, just really basic Auslan, but it just shows compassion, understanding, shows that our needs are being considered. So, yeah. I find that um, really interesting the way you describe that, Kate, because um, I only started learning Ausland in my late 20s and it was originally after I had a hand injury and I was kind of approaching it like um, it was going to be rehabilitation for my hands. Um, and I was, again, very diligent and I was like, I'm going to do this right and I was very stiff and my face was very flat and it was in the classroom environment. I took it very seriously and it wasn't until I went to a deaf meetup and I was petrified of going to a deaf meetup because I thought deaf people would make fun of me or not accept me. And it was in a crowded pub in Melbourne and I, it took me a while to find them and I went up to wrong tables because everyone, it was so loud, everyone was sort of, you know, speaking with their hands and I didn't know who I was meeting up with. Um, but I found the group of people in the pub and they're in the centre of the room, really crowded. It was kind of a summery Friday night, lots of after work drinks. And I sat down and I put my hands under my legs and I was so nervous and I didn't even want to show my hands just in case I signed something incorrectly and would embarrass myself. Um, but then with a bit of Dutch courage, I had a couple of drinks. I just started to watch people communicate and then I started to get involved and I made a million mistakes but it was accepted and my confidence over those two hours grew and grew and grew. And I left a pub for the first time in my life feeling electric as opposed to like feeling so flat and alone and just absolutely spent that it was such a stark difference that I was like, oh my goodness, this language fits my body. I'm not fluent I'm a long way from being fluent but I was able to be in the center of a crowded room and engage with people whereas usually I'm at the edges of a room kind of pressed against the wall or kind of trying to lean in and angle my ear it was just such a different experience and it really um made me realize how much I had been missing in my deaf experience and something that I've tried to incorporate a lot more signing into my life. And when I do meet up with deaf people now, using a mix of um, spoken English and Auslan signing, and we just gel and connect. And it's just, it's such a delight. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, we have a few comments on the chat. Uh, I'm just going to read them out loud in case you've missed them. Um, so Maxine is saying that being hard of hearing is exhausting and that she agrees with Ala and that she very much appreciates when people are willing to adjust and be accommodating. Um, and to that, Simone also says, um, society needs to see that the effort deaf and hard of hearing people make to access everything every day is much lar larger than the occasional difficulty hearing people have accommodating these needs. Um, and there's one question. Um, does speaking slowly make it easier for you to understand and to um, engage if people are speaking slowly? More like, more like clearly. As opposed to slowly? I don't like people talking slow, uh, slowly. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, ah, I, I, had, <laughs> I had a particularly hard time moving to Australia because Australians don't like saying their consonants. 
<laughs> Whereas at least in the Philippines, like we, you know, we talk very crisply. You can probably hear it in my accent. Like I love saying all my R's and my G's and all of that. But Australians, you know, I tend to be really sorry. I'm not making fun of you guys, <laughs> but I just found it really hard to adjust. Uh, it's a much lazier tongue than the Filipino tongue. So I really appreciate people who speak clearly <laughs> for me. I think we have time for um, one more question. Does anybody have any last thoughts? Not so um, much tell me all together, write, write, a, um, write a book with photography. That would be brilliant. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no reason why not. Because like no four of us could like um, educate like the young people, like families, um, like um, primary age children. There's so many like things that possible that maybe not yet like um, explored. Absolutely. Well, I'll put you all guys in touch after this event and we can definitely make some more magic happen. Um, it would be brilliant if today is the start of a great collaborative project. And I mean, ultimately, I think that's the whole point. I think that we're trying to build community, um, whatever shape or form that takes. That's up to you guys. Um, I've got another question. I'll read out. So uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, I'll just read it out. It says, um, David says, I really agree with Darren that Auslan should also be taught to deaf and hard of hearing young children and that signing when speaking would be additionally helpful. I also relate to Kate's experience. Um, hold on, it's a very long comment and I'm trying to. Um, I also relate to Kate's experience of not really thinking of myself. Um, as deaf or hard of hearing as I was growing up, which looking back now created some problems, created some problems of, of blaming myself when I couldn't understand things and choosing to avoid social situations. I guess from watching you all speak tonight that it's only in the last few years or so that I've started really to think of myself as being deaf. Now that I'm reaching this point in my life, I'm not always sure how I can connect with other hard of hearing and deaf people. Do any of the speakers have any suggestions for me, how I might reach out for the deaf and hard of hearing community, and I guess tips on how to adapt to thinking of myself more as a deaf and hard of hearing person? Um, if I may, yeah, there's this really good Facebook group that I found called Australian Hearing Loss Community. It, um, you'll find people with all, um, all kinds of hearing loss and deafness there, it doesn't discriminate. And people there are really, um, really open about sharing, you know, their fears and their worries and their vulnerabilities. I've found that it's, it's been a really amazing supportive community. I'm only just finding other deaf and hard of hearing people now at this time in my life. So yeah, never too late. <clears throat> I have a question for everybody, but uh, as um, hard of hearing uh, um, people, when uh, someone has um, it may be in a group like with your family and things, and someone has said something and, and you haven't quite picked it up, but everyone's laughing, do you laugh along as well, even though you haven't understood it? it depends what, what kind of mood I'm in. <laughs> If I feel like engaging, then I'll ask. If I don't feel like engaging, then I'll laugh. Yeah, because a lot yeah. of hearing people want to feel like we belong. We're not yes. different. Like we're the same as you. Therefore, if everyone's laughing and I've missed it, I would laugh too. Yeah, you laugh and then people ask you about the joke after and you'll have to admit, <laughs> um, I actually didn't understand what was going on. But... As I mentioned, I had a deaf uncle growing up and um, looking at him, you would never know that he was deaf. He just knows when to laugh. He knows when someone is telling a joke, you know, he'll sit because we used to have dinner with the entire extended family every Sunday, you know, so there'd be like 15 people at this long, long table in my grandmother's house and he'd be there and he would know when it was a sad story, when it was a funny story and, you know, and he would react the right way. And it didn't matter if he knew what we were saying. He just wanted to feel like he belonged and... That's all that, that's all that matters. 
And in that sense, I think um, what we were talking about earlier um, today and what David was saying in terms of um, creating community, and Darren, you also mentioned this, it's so important because um, I think one of the things that came up in all of your stories is that like the, the, the loneliness, if you don't have it, but also the, the craving of that sense of belonging and how like it's really hard when um, you are living a tangibly different experience and the people that are around you and the people that are around you are completely oblivious to it. Um, either out of ignorance or because they don't have the education and forget and because it's an invisible condition it's like it's easy to forget when but it shouldn't you know um, so in that sense creating community and creating awareness can go a very long way um, in, in the sense of creating that sense of belonging um, we have another question from David Ala what was the title of the Facebook group that you mentioned Oh, you've already answered it. Australian Hearing Loss Community. So for anyone who's interested in, in finding and meeting other people um, from the deaf and hard of hearing community, check that Facebook group out. And also um, let us know, because at Sanford we're really interested in, in also taking part in this. So let us know what you need and let us know um, if there are any gaps right now that need addressing, because we'd be very keen to take part in that and facilitate things wherever possible. Um, and no worries, David, always happy to read out your words. Um, we're nearing the end of tonight. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for coming, um, both audience and storytellers. It's really been a pleasure. Um, if anyone today has a story that they'd like to share, um, there's a link that I'll post right now in the chat um, to share your story. We're always publishing um, stories on our website and on our socials. So, oh, hold on. Nope. Well, I'll, I'll post it soon when I finish speaking because I can't seem to multitask. <laughs> but um, we're always on the lookout for stories. So um, please send us your story or if you know anyone that story should be heard, we're more than happy to, to spread the word and hopefully reach other people and through these stories, start creating this sense of community. Um, also, our next session is on, on the Thursday 5th of August, so in a month's time. And um, we're very excited because we're going to have a First Nations um, session. So we're going to have um, four Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. And we'll be hearing what their experience has been like um, and their own challenges and, and, and projects. So you're more than welcome to, to come along. If you liked it um, today, please spread the word. If you didn't, please let us know what didn't work. Um, we're always, again, this is our second session, so we're still learning and um, we're always happy to hear your comments and suggestions um, as we move forward. Um, I believe there was a question by Shelly that was missed above. I think we have like five more minutes. So um, Shelly, if you could please write your question again. Uh, I can, um, it, I can answer. It was if children, should, all children should be taught Auslan. Um, yeah, I think that having Auslan, I mean, a lot of schools are now offering mm. it to all uh, students and Darren can probably answer this more um, uh, better, but I, I think it is a great way to show inclusion and um, for make, I guess, yeah, bringing those communities together. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it'd be a great idea. Yeah. I'm hoping that one day, like my um, book that published, so they can like <clears throat> open like deafness in schools and make it for hearing children aware that deaf children are not, um, or deaf people are not different. Because when I was growing up in school, they were always like teased. It was the worst experience because we were different. And I'm sure that many deaf, hard of hearing people go through the same. And we don't want that to happen. There's other uh, books that I have, like him, like a similar like, um, series. It's like I'm teasing them. Thomas is terrible, and um, the new girl is different. So there are books that are similar, like same, if you like, that hopefully will be that published for um, children at school. Thank you so much, Darren and Kate, for that. And yeah, absolutely. Um, creating again that sense of like people not having to all like hard of hearing and deaf people not having to often and constantly adapt to hearing people's um needs but 
more of an equilibrium because I, I definitely agree that self-advocating is already at all. Um, Fiona, did you have a comment? Um, I also think it's really important that there are deaf role models in the media um, and the opportunity to see Ausland used in many different ways. At the moment, it's um, changed dramatically in the last 18 months to two years, but um, often Auslan, the only representation on TV is in press conferences with really uh, tragic news of emergencies on a national scale. And I don't think that gives the language enough justice of how um, intelligent and poetic and um, incredible it is. And we rarely see two people signing together on television. Um, in memory, I can only remember that once. So it's, it's so very rare that we see Ausland um, in all of its uh, capacity. It's very much um, just in news conferences. So I think um, normalising the language and all sign languages uh, is essential for the wider community to accept it um, and even embrace it and celebrate the fact that sign languages are intelligent and um, challenging. I think one thing that a lot of people are shocked about is when they go to learn sign language that it is a language with grammar and syntax and it's bloody hard to learn like it's really challenging you can't learn it in an afternoon but it's um, a really complex incredible intelligent language thank you so much fiona um, well, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. I have now posted the link um, for people to share their story if they want. I've also posted a link where you can RSVP for our next session. And if anyone else in the audience um, like today and would like to get um, be involved as a storyteller, um, please get in touch. We're always looking for storytellers. So um, we'd love to, to have you. Um, a final note on what Kate said about representation. I think another thing that at least I have noticed in stepping into this role is that more often than not, we see um, hard of hearing and deaf people's stories portrayed in a very negative um, light in terms of like, oh, look at this poor person who suffered this much and kind of like with a almost like a pity element to it um, in traditional media, which I think is very counterintuitive towards generating a sense of pride and community. So while we definitely need to advocate for creating awareness and understanding the challenges and creating empathy, um, we still have a long way to go in terms of representation in, in ensuring that there's this diversity portrayed and that there's the stories of like what you said Fiona that being deaf and hard of hearing is part of an identity and it's part of who you are and that it can be enriching in so many ways because it opens up so many other avenues um, and and yeah it's it's a much richer experience that we currently are led to believe. Um, so hopefully events like this are a step towards in the right direction. Um, we hope you all enjoyed it um, and look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for organizing it, Lou. Thank you so Have much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Everyone. Thank you. And lovely to meet all of you. Awesome. Yeah, lovely to meet you. <laughs> lovely to meet you. Bye. 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 Bye.